Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. When it comes to evangelism, you can't evangelize someone where you've burned bridges with them. One of the reasons why I'm careful what I say and what I do in person, online, is because I want to build a relationship with someone who's been completely deceived by the devil and deceived by sin. I want to build a relationship with them so I can help them see the truth and understand the gospel. See, every person who has decided to have an abortion is forgiven if they believe in Jesus Christ, and God forgives them, and God loves them, and they need to know that. <clears throat> but if I'm burning bridges before I even get a chance to share the good news, that's terrible. And so that's, again, why we need to be careful how we conduct ourselves and what we say. I'm starting an evangelism series because we're out and about now, and I believe God led me this direction, and um, I will be gone for a couple weeks here <clears throat> in July, but uh, Teen Challenge will be here as well to share. If you're not aware, aware of adult and Teen Challenge, it's where uh, people have overcome or dealing with addictions and trying to overcome. But the, the success rate is so high with Adult and Teen Challenge, so we're excited about them coming in a few weeks. But I wanted to start at least with three weeks of evangelism to help us, because we're out in our neighborhoods, we're out and out and about, and uh, we have a chance to shine Jesus Christ, even in the midst of all the tension and all the discomfort that's going on right now. And so let's make Jesus known. And today, <clears throat> I want to talk about the burden for the lost. Burden for the lost. I want to answer a really important question later, too. Someone just asked me this question. They were really honest and really vulnerable, and I appreciate it. And they asked the question, what do I do if I don't feel a burden for the lost? What if I don't feel a burden to reach and evangelize? What do I do? So I'm going to get there, but let's start with the theological foundation of God's burden for the lost and his heart and desire to see the lost saved. Uh, missio Dei. Have you heard that word before? Missio Dei, or two words. It's a Latin Christian theological term that can be translated as the mission of God or the sending of God. It is a concept that has become increasingly important in the missiology and in the understanding of the mission of the church in the world. And even more so in the latter 20th century, churches are starting to pay more attention that the purpose of the church is to glorify God and to help other people glorify God, to glorify God and help other people believe in Jesus Christ so that they'll worship him as well. And John 20, 21 is a great verse for that. And this is what Jesus said, peace be with you as the father has sent me I am sending you. This is what he told his disciples. And he would tell them to go and make disciples. And those disciples should go and make disciples. So guess what you are? Disciples. disciples followers of Jesus. God's mission and desire is part of the grand narrative and message in the Bible. God promised Abraham that he would give him a child. I've said this recently before, so I won't go into the details of it that he would give him a child, and through him, he would be a blessing to all nations, okay? Opening the door for all people, not just the Jews to find salvation, but for all people to be able to be saved. This became a reality through the incarnate flesh living Jesus Christ here on earth. And when Jesus was born, they called him Jesus because he would save his people from their sins, is what it says in Scripture. And Jesus himself said in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You know how awesome that is that Jesus knew why he was here? I thank God that he knew that, and I thank God that he delivered on it. Amen. Because I'm one of those people he saved from my sin. And Jesus accomplished it on the cross and at the resurrection. So I thank the Lord for that. Now, <clears throat> Jesus, in his life of living, he shared the gospel to more than just the Jews. He was talking to Gentiles like the Samaritan woman. He was trying to show his disciples that I have come not just for you and this nation, but all people who would believe. The life of Christ was complete obedience to the mission of God. 
Jesus had to fulfill what uh, he, in his heart, he had to, he wanted to fulfill and obey everything God had given him. And he did. And what he did, though, is before he left, he sent his disciples out in John 20 when he said, now I send you. He sent them out to go complete the mission with God's help. Who would be the helper? The Holy Spirit. John 14 through 16 talks about that. So Jesus sent us out with the help and the power of his presence, the Holy Spirit, the helper and the advocate to go reach the lost. You can read about this, mainly a lot of it, in the book of Acts. It's a biography or even a real-life documentary of the acts of the Spirit working through his followers and believers, and they accomplish great things like establishing the church. So just so you know, church, uh, we are now in the era where we are supposed to finish the work assigned to us. We're partners in his mission. Um, Just as I said earlier, when the Holy Spirit convicts, it also means convince. I've been praying that the Holy Spirit will convince you that you are sent people. And that not only are you sent people, but you're empowered people with the help of the Holy Spirit. We're spirit-filled believers, spirit-filled disciples that can make disciples. And I'm not a gambling person or anything like that, um, but I bet you if you tried, you will watch the Holy Spirit show up in your life. So um, are all people evangelists? No, not all people have the gift of evangelism, but have all of us been saved in this room, hopefully, right, Brian? Do we have a testimony? Yes, and so we can proclaim the good works that God has done and share our testimony. Do, can we know the scriptures and be a part of the mission? Yes. Can we share the gospel? Yes. Are some people just more gifted at it than others? Yeah. But we can all show and promote Jesus Christ and make him known no matter what your background is. Uh, let's go to the scriptures. <clears throat> psalm 96. I'm going to use a psalm for our scripture on evangelism. Psalm 96, if you would turn to that, God's why is our why. And from this scripture, we're gonna have four reasons we make Jesus known, and then I'll share four ways that we can fan the flame and the burden uh, of the lost in our lives. Psalm 96, let me get some water real quick. I'm extra dry today. Psalm 96, verse 1, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. You know the Lord deserves that much worship, right? That the whole earth would sing. Sing to the Lord, praise his name each day, proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. You know, with social media and the internet, we can publish all the time, can't we? Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Has he done amazing things in your life? I bet you he has. He has a mind. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, little g. Okay, the gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens just showing his supremacy and authority and power. He is greater than any other gods that we have made up as humans. He has made the heavens. He's made the people who make up gods. That's how powerful he is. Honor and majesty surround God. Strength and beauty fill his sanctuary. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Oh, Lord, let that be done. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give it to the Lord the glory, or give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his courts. You know one of of God's favorite offerings is? Your life. It is his favorite. Your heart. He wants your heart. If he has your heart, you'll give him anything. 
and you'll do anything for him. And it won't be because you have to, it won't be because you're a robot, it's because you love him. Worship the Lord, verse nine, in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. Tell all the nations the Lord reigns. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. He will judge all peoples fairly. Thank the Lord that God is our judge ultimately in the end and not human beings. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and their crops burst out with joy. Let the trees of the forest rustle with praise before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with justice, and he's a just and fair God, and the nations with his truth. So just so you know, right or before he says he's gonna judge the nations, he asks the nations to recognize him. In other words, God is pleading through his scripture for nations that come back to him they all belong to him. Come back to your creator. Let me give you four reasons we, can, um, we would make Jesus known from this scripture. Four reasons we would make the Lord known, God known from this scripture. And the first one is through verses one through three. Uh, God's children are invited to join him in the Missio Dei. We've been, we've been invited to join him in the, the, the mission of God and we've been sent out to do it because he says, proclaim the good news, publish his good deeds. Now, just so you know, all of, all of earth is God's and all creation is God's. We believe that God is the creator of all things, that we belong to him. And in 1 Kings 8, when they reestablished the temple, and they brought the ark back in, Solomon prayed this amazing prayer and he's from the Jewish nation of the Israelites. And uh, so he is a Jew, but he actually shows us that the gospel is for all people, or the Lord and God is for all people in verses uh, 41 through 43. So I don't have this on the screen, but 1 Kings chapter 8, 41 through 43, if you want to write that down anywhere. And this is what Solomon prays. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. So King Solomon just said, God, when the foreigner who's not an Israelite, not a Jew, when he comes to this temple or, he, or he, they even face the temple wherever they are and pray to you, would you please hear them from heaven? That is, that is the people of Israel wanting the whole earth to come and believe in God. That is powerful. He goes on to say this, do whatever the foreigner asks of you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel and may know that this house I have built bears your name. Uh, Calvary believes that all people can be saved, not only a select few, but God wishes that none shall perish. And I'll get into that in a moment. So that's the first part. You've been invited to tell the world all that he's done in your life and what he's done in other lives, and we're supposed to proclaim and publish this to the world. And uh, you are one of the best billboards out there because you're a changed life. And so don't be afraid to share all the things that God has done in your life. He, he wants us to be a part of it. He wants us to go and tell the good things he has done in us. So that's a reason. How about number two? Number two, the vanity of this world and its false gods. That's in verses four through five. In verses four through five, he says there is no, there, there, there's other gods and they're just mere idols. And the Bible says it over and over again, especially in Isaiah 45 or Isaiah 44, there is no other gods. Now that's offensive to people because now you're exclusive and that there is no other gods, 
There's only one God. That's, that's mean towards other religions. I don't see it that way, but I understand how people might take it that way. But the reality is God loves us so much, he's telling us the truth. He's saying, you're wasting your time. It's in vain to worship other gods. Just so you know. Uh, some people actually think there are other gods. There is no other gods. God wouldn't create other gods to compete with. We've done that enough. He talks about it many times in the prophets, especially in Isaiah, where these idols were just on a, on a shelf and they fall over and you, a human, have to pick it up to help it be back standing on its legs again, whatever idol that was. God defends himself. God lifts himself up. God takes care of business himself. God is the only God. So parents, when I was a youth pastor and I had a parent tell me that, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my kid decide what religion they'll follow or what God they'll follow, I said, that's going to be in vain. There is no other God. There's only one. If you know, this is how the devil works. Let me make sure there's a lot of other confusing religions and gods so that you can't tell which one's true. That's what happened. And mankind creates our own gods because we don't like the one of the Bible. I mean, that's hard to swallow for some people. It's hard for some people to accept. There may be some people in this room who are upset by me saying this. And I don't mean this in disrespect towards your religion and, or maybe uh, towards your views on this. All I'm saying is if you truly love someone, you will warn them that they're going down a path where the cliff, it's just gone. There's a cliff. There's no way to eternity. And God is saying all of those things and the world and its pleasure is all in vain. You're wasting your time. There's only one true God. When I learn this, and when I realized this, it changed the way I evangelize because it makes me feel bad for people because they've fallen for the lies of the devil. And I want to save them from that. When, when people say, what do you mean by lost? That's an idea of lost. They're lost in a bunch of different ideas and different false teachings. They're lost in a, in a world and a pool of gods, and they don't know what to believe or think. And that's the person I love to minister to is the one that doesn't know what to believe or think. At least that's a clean slate. God has called us to tell the world about him, about Jesus, and to tell them the truth. And the truth does hurt at times but do it with gentleness and respect and love and perhaps they will come back to hear more. They don't always do that. Perhaps they will. Thirdly, God's love for all people and nations. We see that in verses seven through nine. You've already heard my heart on this, but just so you know, God doesn't delight in the perish of the wicked or the lost. God doesn't delight in that. Uh, where do I get that from? Ezekiel 33, 11. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn, turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? See, that's the same thing I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with God. Why should you follow a false God that doesn't exist, that leads you to nowhere? And it's all in vain. Why should we follow the world? The world doesn't know what it wants to do and be. Why would we enjoy it? We should live apart from it as we live in it. Second Peter 3, verse 9 and 15. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed or perish, but wants everyone to repent. And verse 15 says, and remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. Why, why are we evangelizing? That's why. And by the way, we shouldn't wait to a series to start evangelizing. And I'm praying that from this series, you'll be motivated to evangelize the rest of your life and lead people to the Lord. But this is a reason why. God doesn't want any of you to perish. He doesn't want any of your neighbors to perish. 
Why do they have to perish? Well, he actually brings that up in the next part. Why, does, why would anyone have to perish? Well, sin has to be dealt with. Wickedness is rampant in our world right now. And in Matthew 24, verse 12, I believe, it says that this sin will be rampant in the last days. It looks like that's happening. Okay? And he has to deal with it because he's a just God. Okay? If someone did a crime, they should be dealt with justly. Now, here's the thing. The gospel is good news because Jesus pays for your sin, which is radical grace that I don't understand still sometimes. It's amazing grace. The good news is, is Jesus has paid for our sins. So we are justified and innocent in the sight of the Lord. Come judgment day. So guess what happens at the last four verses of this scripture, 96, is the next reason why we would evangelize. The Lord is returning to judge. The Lord is returning to judge. That's why I evangelize. Because he's coming back and he would judge us according to his truth. Another reason why the devil makes sure there's a lot of competing ideas so you can't tell what the truth is. What is truth? There's no such thing as absolute truth. Are you absolutely sure about that? Because you just contradicted yourself when you say that. See, these are the things you're gonna deal with when you, when you encounter people. I'm not saying to argue, but the reality is, the truth is that he is coming back and he would judge and those who have the blood of Christ over them by faith will be saved. And the Bible just, we just read the Bible. He says he wants everyone. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but to turn and repent. Um, not everyone's going to listen to these messages in the scripture when you go to share your faith. Um, just be aware of that. And I'll get into more of who do we go to, how do we do it, and all those things in the coming weeks. But I am grateful for someone who came to me in a, couple, a couple weeks ago and said, Ryan, I'm dealing with just that feeling, that lack of compassion and feeling to reach the lost. I don't, it doesn't really come up in my everyday life. Um, you know what? That was amazing transparency. And I really appreciate that. And you know what? He's not alone. <laughs> if we were honest, I think a lot of us struggle sometimes to feel a burden to reach and save the lost. I'm not going to do a show of hands, but let's be real. It may not really be on our radar every day, is it? And, and what, do, what do we need to do then to grow in that burden? Well, let me give you four things in closing. Uh, I would encourage you to study God's heart for the lost. Maybe, maybe you've been struggling to feel that compassion. And uh, let me actually preface with this. Just so you know, God can do anything he wants because he's God. And you may not feel a burden for someone. You may not feel compassion for someone who seems to be lost who seems to be an unbeliever. You may not feel it, but then the Holy Spirit comes upon you and quickens your heart to feel for someone. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but it's happened to me. Like I wasn't thinking evangelism today, even though I always should, because God wants to work through me to reach people. I wasn't thinking about it one time at a coffee shop, and then the Holy Spirit just quickened my heart to look around and see, and I felt for someone in the room, and I simply said, hey, are you going through something? Can I pray for you, or is there anything I can pray for? So don't count out the Holy Spirit. He may show up in your life out of nowhere when you don't even feel, feel it. He's going to work in you to reach people. But I do believe that at times we have to fan the flame of the burden for the lost. We have to wave it and make the flame grow in our lives and keep that ember burning. And so one of the ways that I keep it burning is I study the heart of God. I want to not just read the word for something I want. I want to read the word for who God is. I'm not going into it just to figure out certain topics in my life. And, and for this one, though, I'm asking you to look at the heart of God for the lost. 
okay? Look at the heart of God. So sometimes, by the way, when I go to read the Bible, I have my own agenda and I'll read right over a scripture that shows the heart for the loss that God has. I'll read right over it because I'm looking for something for myself. You see, you know what I'm saying? You follow me on that? So I'm encouraging you to now open your eyes to see how God grieves for the lost. And I would encourage you to start reading through the Gospels. I would encourage you to start reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts, and look at how many times Jesus cares for those who are lost or unbelievers. Look at how many times the church reaches unbelievers in the book of Acts. What am I saying to do? I'm saying to get in tune with God's heart. Feel what he feels. See what he sees. And you'll begin to start caring more. Secondly, pray for unbelievers. Did you know that prayer is care? (laughs) It's hard to pray for people when you don't care for them. But when you care about someone, you pray for them. Am I right? Pray for unbelievers. Romans 10.1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. This is Paul. He's talking to the Roman church, so the Gentiles, and he's concerned for the Israelites who have not believed in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And his heart is longing that they would be saved. One of the ways that my burden for the lost grows is I make sure I pray for them every day. When you pray for things, you see things. When you pray for things, your heart becomes aware of things going on around you. Prayer isn't just for you. Prayer is for everyone around you too. Do we intentionally pray for those who are lost, who are hurting, who are wicked, who are broken, and so on? Because compassion comes out of that prayer. Thirdly, and by the way, I I mean that uh, seriously. I know you understand I do. But what I, I would encourage you to write down some names of people that you want to pray for. It's not just a good idea. It's something that we need to act on. So if you have a prayer journal that goes along with your Bible or some kind of note journal, why don't you jot a few names down there that you can pray for every day? In fact, I believe that as you pray for them, you will all of a sudden start having ideas of how to minister to them. Because the Holy Spirit's going to give you and guide you with things to do to reach them. Don't just take this as a really good point because prayer is good and it's important. Do something with it and begin to intentionally pray for a few people that you work with, that are in your neighborhood, that you come in contact with all the time. Maybe it's at a grocery store, at a restaurant, wherever it may be, and begin to pray for them and watch your heart grow for them. Watch your concern and your compassion grow for them. Well, Ryan, I'm still struggling to feel that burden. You know what happens sometimes? Sometimes, number three, you just need to love people like Jesus would. Love people. Uh, Have you ever just loved on someone and gave them a gift and now your affection for them grew even more? Did you know that love is a willful act of the heart, not just an emotional act? That the Greek understanding of love is that you love people willfully, not just when you feel like it. That's how marriages stay together, by the way. (laughs) That's how marriages stay together. Can I get an amen from our families and our parents? Ooh, I want to, he's sleeping on the couch. Or she or he needs to change. She needs to change, whatever it may be. I willfully love my wife, and more and more, I have grown more in love with her. It's not just emotions. It's an act of the will to obey God. I don't wait to obey God when I feel him. I obey him, and I love him because he is good, and he is God. It's the same thing here. Are you struggling to feel a burden for the loss? Let me encourage you to, if you're a good baker, bake something for your neighbor. 
If you're not, get a gift card, okay? <laughs> Don't torture them. What about coworkers in your office? Do you know that more people believe in prayer than they believe in God? Isn't that interesting? What if, what if you prayed? What if you asked them if they need prayer for anything? Hey, I'm getting ready to have my lunch break. Before I go, do you need prayer for anything? I'm gonna go pray. All right, great. And then you trust God to answer that prayer. Trust him to answer that prayer. Begin to show love and then your love for people grows, your heart, especially for those who are unbelievers. By the way, you have to make a little bit of a judgment call on someone who may be an unbeliever or lost. I don't know if we got that point in this sermon. It kind of goes unsaid. Um, you can recognize after a while that someone is not a believer or they're, they're, they don't follow Christianity. How? You will know them by their fruits, by what they do and say. Do they act like Jesus, talk like Jesus, talk about the Bible? Do they pray? I, one of the things I always say is, God bless you. And I hear them say, God bless you. God bless you, brother. I'm like, okay. So that's, that person may be a believer right there, right? Um, you know what I do sometimes too? And I'm getting into some other future sermons here, but I also just ask, where are you a God? So I can know and not assume. But you know, even if they are believers, aren't you supposed to love them? So why not find out who are believers by loving on them? And how many of you have done that? You've loved on someone, they're like, you're a believer, aren't you? Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> oh, yeah, my pastor just taught about that. And you find out someone's a Christian and you didn't know it the whole time at your workplace because you love like Jesus. Matthew 9, 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I'm going to encourage you to, to love in such a way that you see people like Jesus sees people. And Jesus didn't just have compassion from a distance. Jesus had compassion up close and he helped people. He ate with them. He lived around them. He encouraged them. He did many things. We learned last week that Jesus loved Peter so much he filled two boats up so he could have a business. Now I'm not saying go out and buy a thousand fish for someone, but help someone in need. Lastly, spend quality time with unbelievers. That's what I was just saying. Jesus ate with unbelievers in the law so he could care, so he could listen, so he could guide and heal and teach and ultimately save. When we spend time with unbelievers, we can listen to their needs and, and show the love and care that they have in their everyday needs. And this increases our awareness of unbelievers around us. So don't feel bad today if you haven't been feeling a burden or an urgency to reach and love and evangelize the lost. I think we all go through those seasons. Let's be real. Let's be honest. But it would be wrong of us to never feel for the lost. That means that we are probably disconnected from the heart of God. The Missio Dei is the entire message of the Bible. The mission of God to seek and to save the lost is the entire Bible. And you are a result of the Missio Dei. And so don't keep it to yourself. And if you need to fan the flame of a burden for the lost, I want to encourage you to do at least these four things or whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Amen? Just go out and shine. Go out and be a light. Go out and love and watch what God does. Don't overcomplicate it. I, I hope that you learn from this series everyday evangelism that anyone can do, not just the evangelists. But we thank God for our evangelists. We thank God for those who are gifted in evangelism. So why don't we stand together? And let's practice what I preached. I'm in this too, by the way. One of the things I do is I get out of the office and I go into coffee shops and I'll work so I can be around 
unbelievers or people who are in the world. I don't know where they are. And I'm reading my Bible a couple weeks ago at Dunkin' Donuts, and um, this gentleman sees my Bible open, and he recognizes it. He looks back twice, and he had the courage to come talk to me about what's going on in our world. And it gave me a chance to find out where he is and encourage him to stand strong in the Lord and to know his word. He said, because he saw me reading the Bible, it inspired and encouraged him to now go home and read the Bible. So he obviously is a a believer in some way. That little bit just encouraged a young man to go home and get closer to God. Be a light in this community. Let's close our eyes and let's think about some people that maybe God has been helping us run into. (laughs) Not car accidents or anything like that. Just walking by or showing up in our lives. Our neighbor keeps popping up in front of our yard. Or Who's the Holy Spirit been bringing to us? Maybe you've been inviting people to this church. Maybe you are here today because someone invited you to this church. That's God. He loves you and he's working through his people. I think I need to take a moment to see if anyone needs to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If there's anyone in this room that says, I'm convinced today I need Jesus. I'm lost without him. I didn't know this message about the Bible. I didn't know there was only one God. I didn't know that he loved me so much. He wishes that none shall perish, that he gave Jesus Christ. I didn't know this message today at all, and now I see it and I believe, and I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to give my heart to him. If that's you, hold a hand up, because we're going to pray with you. And maybe there's someone nearby who wants to lead them to the Lord. I see some praying going on with other people right now. Praise the Lord for that. If you're online, let us know. Drop it in the chat. Let us know you're believing in Jesus Christ right now. You can pray this, Lord, Jesus, I am a sinner. I'm lost without you. Save me. I believe that your cross is the payment for my sins. I believe I'm forgiven now. I accept your forgiveness. I believe it's done. I believe it's been done for me. And I give you my life to follow you. Give me your Holy Spirit to lead and guide me in this life. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me. And Lord, I lift up this church to you, that God, in the midst of our world right now, you still care about the lost. You're still preoccupied with the mission, which is a great preoccupation, of being in, just completely consumed with your missio day the mission of God. God, help us to be preoccupied with what matters the most. Oh, Lord, give us wisdom right now in our world as Christians. Give us wisdom because we can stand for what we believe, and we should. Stand in the truth and the grace of your word. But, Lord, may we also keep a bridge open for those who would not be so combative or those who would not be so against us, but they're still searching for the gospel. So God, help us to show tender-hearted mercy as well to those around us as we stand strong in what we believe, because it is true. There is no other God but you. And so God, we're concerned for those who are lost and going the wrong way and believe in the wrong things. So God, give us the grace and the abilities and the power to minister to those people. And Lord, stir up the burden for the lost in this church. Stir up in our hearts, God, to see what you see, to love the way you love. And God, give us divine opportunities this week to minister and to show love in the acts of kindness, to the prayers, to even sharing our testimony. I thank you, God, for this church. I thank you that we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for evangelism. But Lord, as we approach the last days more and more, Help us to match that with urgency in our lives. 
We give you all the glory and praise for the words spoken today. We do it all for your glory. And we thank you for your spirit ministering in this room. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.